It's a wonderful opportunity as I get myself together trying to reach for all of these different cameras. I thank God for you as we prepare to share with you a wonderful topic tonight entitled, What Sexual Acts Are Forbidden by Scripture? Now, here's what I'm asking that you would please do. I'm asking that you would please, and as a matter of fact, I'm doing something I'm not supposed to do because I know definitely uh, Facebook is watching and uh, there's certain algorithms that they have set in place and they definitely pay attention to these live uh, videos. And so according to the algorithm, I'm not supposed to ask you to do this, but I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to ask that you would do this tonight. Please share this every place that you possibly can as we discuss the Word of God tonight. As we discuss the Word of God tonight, just want to make sure that we're not uh, fading in and out. If we fade in and out, don't forget you can watch on Instagram, you can watch on Periscope, you can watch on my personal page as well as my fan page, and we are also on Twitter right now. Bless all of you, bless all of you. We're going to be sharing a great topic tonight. We're out of a wonderful International Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ. Somebody saying, Hankerson, do you have a whole lot of energy? Not as much as I possibly can because you, 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 and especially you prayed against me drinking those five-hour energy drinks. So can you believe it? I made it all week long on a whole lot of water and a whole lot of vitamins, six or seven different vitamins I was uh, taking to try to supplement. Worked out pretty good. Of course, I had to leave out of service quite a few times drinking the most holy water, but thank you so much for your prayers. We had a great convocation, the Lord blessed, great classes, great impartation that took place, and uh, what did we learn out of it? In our evangelism classes, we learned about the latest evangelistic techniques in reaching the lost and reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, we talked about e-church, which is a um, very new subject and um, very interesting and intriguing subject. Also, we thank God that 67 souls uh, have received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior during the Holy Convocation. Now, of course, that's just dealing with street ministry uh, because our teams were preaching on the streets, and that's also dealing with our Christmas in November. The numbers will be coming in pretty soon in regard to the altar because we had some tremendous altar services that took place. But the convocation is over. I'm so glad that I got to see the saints. So glad I got to fellowship. But yes, we're glad that that time is over. Not in the sense that we never want to uh, see the saints again, but um, it's just a, a good tire that all the saints have, a good tire. The Holy Convocation is basically like our family reunion in the Church of God in Christ. So wonderful to meet so many of you. I got to meet many of you face to face, walking through the hallways. And what did I tell you? What did I tell you? So many of you said that you watch. I said, make some comments. I don't always get a chance to get back and watch the comments uh, uh, real in-depthly, but it is a blessing to see the various things that you say. So we want to get directly into the Word of God. Let's pray and discuss tonight, and possibly I'll have a chance to deal with some questions what sexual acts are forbidden by Scripture? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Bless us as we delve into the pages of your holy word. Your word have we hid in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Bless everyone that is watching. Bless those that are watching live, those that are going to watch the uh, reprogramming of the webcast. We thank you so much for this opportunity to reach souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now bless us and we'll bless you. And we thank you that you love us. We thank you right now for this great salvation. Everyone that said, pray for me. Father, I pray that you would touch them even right now and meet those needs. In Jesus' name, let the people of God say, thank God. Amen. Say amen in the comment section if you are in agreement with the fact that you are blessed. Please note tonight that we're asking you for a special love token and seed, as many can and will. Please sow a seed and to the International Department of Evangelism of the Churches of God in Christ as we share the gospel with the lost. You can go to Givelify right now and look up COGIC, International Department of Evangelism. I will receive the notifications from our finance team, and we will thank you for helping us to spread this glorious gospel. We are looking to reach the lost as far as the deaf community is concerned. That ministry, the foundation is being laid. The team has been meeting, preparing to launch out. There's 24 million deaf people in America, 248 deaf million uh, deaf people rather in the world. And so we're looking to reach all of them with the gospel and so many other things that we won't share right now. 
but that's our simple task is to spread the gospel. Some of you may ask, now why I deal with a subject like this tonight, what sexual acts are forbidden by scripture? The reason why is because there are so many questions that people ask in regard to the Christian faith as far as its relevancy to their everyday life. And so many people are turned off by Christianity because it seems like um, we don't try to answer many of the questions that people have and they're trying to figure out what does going to church, what does sitting in Bible study have to do with the daily life that I live, whether that's my marriage, whether that's dealing with my kids, um, how does it apply? Let me tell you what, the Word of God applies to every area of life, even when it comes to sex. Sex is not a bad word, so please understand that. People make it a bad word, and uh, people act embarrassed when it comes to the subject of sex uh, because it's almost been made a taboo to even mention that particular word. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I have my most holy water close next to me. But nevertheless, sex is mentioned in the Bible. Sexual relations are mentioned in the Bible. The Bible, as a matter of fact, says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is literally talking about the sexual act or the consummation of the marriage. <clears throat> so sex is something sacred that God has uh, blessed and given to humanity, not just so much for uh, procreation alone, but also for the bond of the marriage uh, relationship. So let's go through scripture and let's see what it has to say in regard to things that are forbidden. Uh, of course, people may ask, well, what is okay? Well, we'll kind of delve into some of that as we go through the scriptures. First of all, in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 6, the Bible teaches that incest is a forbidden act of sex. Incest being having sex with someone that is a close relative. Now, the question was asked earlier in regard to the um, marriage of those that are cousins. Let's read through this one verse, Leviticus 18 and 6, and then Leviticus chapter 18, verses 7 through 18, and allow you to hear from the Word of God to make that decision. I think people that have tuned in week by week know that I don't come as the Bible answer man, even though I don't know whether he's still on anymore, but I used to love listening to uh, the Bible answer man. And um, speaking of Bible answer man, someone's ringing the doorbell right now for the church, and I can't get up and go answer them while I'm talking to you. So um, we'll be praying. Hopefully whoever it is that's um, trying to get in will uh, check back a little bit later. Uh, but the Bible answer man would give answers to different things in regard to his interpretation of Scripture. My, my job, my task, what I feel God has laid on my heart is to stir you up to seek, the, seek God for yourself, to know the Word of God for yourself. I'll give you Scripture. I'll point you in the direction that you can look, but uh, it doesn't really help for me to just give you all the answers. You've got to know the Scriptures, know the Word of God, learn it for yourself, and then you will be able to uh, get answers uh, much quicker than the person that's ringing the doorbell that I'm not answering right now. Leviticus, that's terrible, isn't it? Pray for this. Pray, pray for Hankerson. Just put that in the comment section right now. Pray for Hankerson. Pray for him. There's only one Hankerson in the Church of God in Christ. Um, I, I, I think there's more than one Hankerson in the body of Christ, but nevertheless, saints wouldn't be able to handle more than one. You ought to thank God for that. Leviticus 18 and 6 says this, No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. And so I know that there have been cases where people have married their fourth and fifth and sixth cousin or whatever, um, however, you must seek God through that particular passage of Scripture to get an answer to that. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. So first of all, incest is forbidden in the Bible. Leviticus 18, 7 through 18 says this, Do not dishonor your father or mother by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have sex with her. Do not have sex with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Uh, I'm in verse 9 of Leviticus uh, 18. Do not have sex with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. So if it's stepsister, stepbrother, however, the um, Lord says here in verse 9, leave that alone. Do not have sex relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife. Born to your father, she is your sister. Do not have sex with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. That's verse 12. Verse 13, do not have sex with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. 
Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She's your aunt. Do not have sex with your daughter-in-law. She's your son's wife. Do not have sex with her. 16, do not have sex with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. 17, do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is wickedness. And also Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18, do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife online. Can you all please send a message to the saints that we're in Tuesday night live? So please quit ringing the doorbell and trying to call it this time. So basically the scripture is saying you're not to have sex with any close relative. Obviously the reason why the word of God had to mention that is because people were doing this and felt that it was okay, but it's not okay. One of the problems that we attack quite often in the church and mention quite often in the church, and of course we're going to mention it here, is of course uh, same-sex relationships, whether that be homosexuality or lesbianism. Now, some of the root cause of that has been the fact that there are people that um, have been sexually abused, or another term is molested, um, even as children. There's been incestuous relationships that have taken place. And a lot of times that's the root cause of this particular behavior. And so when we see people struggling with same-sex um, attraction, same-sex relationships, we need to ask what is the root cause? Where is that coming from? And just like from the pulpit, we pound from the pulpit up against adultery. We pound from the pulpit against fornication. We pound uh, from the pulpit against um, homosexuality and lesbianism. The scripture also is very explicit. I just read to you numerous verses from Leviticus chapter 18, verses 7 through 18 in regard to this, where the scripture says incest is completely forbidden. And there's a lot of people will put on a mask like they're so holy and righteous and sanctified, quickened in church and talk in tongues, but then when they go home, they are sexual predators. They are sexual monsters. And so the Bible talks specifically against this. Now, some may look at me and say, well, Hankerson, really, you're reading from the Old Testament and that does not apply to us. Realize this. The question I want to ask you is what Bible was Paul using? What Bible was Matthew using? What Bible was Jesus using? They, they were using what we would refer to as the Old Testament. And so if that's the scriptures, if that's the Bible that they use, even during the time of the Acts of the Apostles, when the believers were taking the world, and these that have turned the world upside down have come here also, um, if that's the Bible that they used, and that's also a portion of our Bible, along with our New Testament. If they could turn the world upside down with Genesis to Malachi, imagine how much more we can do from Matthew to Revelation. And Jesus said um, this, he said, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father, which is in heaven. And so that's not cute to, to, do in, to have incest or even to uh, try to entice or to seduce somebody within a family. A lot of times you have civil rival, si, si, uh, sibling rivalry uh, that takes place and maybe someone is in the family is jealous because one of the family members went out and got married and they have a wonderful marriage. And so there's someone in the household, in the family saying, well, you know what, I'm going to break that marriage up. And it's not so much, realize this, sexual sin isn't always about sex. Sometimes it's about power. And that's what people try to do many times is use their uh, sexual appetite or, or sexual ability, whatever, to try to pull down other people just in a sense of power. Not so much because they're attracted to an individual, but I'm going to use this as an opportunity to break things up for that person. I can't stand the fact that they are happy. I can't stand the fact um, that, that things are working well for them. And uh, you will find that among friends. You will find that in the church. Realize this. Let me say this to everybody. Everyone that is in your face is not necessarily your friend. Some people are happy as long as you're miserable because they have somebody to be miserable with. But as soon as you make up your mind, hey, I'm, I'm going to do some things to better myself. I'm, I'm going to get out there and, um, you know, advance myself. And then possibly, you know, you find love and you end up um, getting married and people that you thought were really in your corner. Now they're jealous of you and uh, seek to try to destroy what God has blessed you with. And it happens even in the church. You'd be surprised 
And let me say this to the unchurched that are listening and viewing, um, you know, the church is supposed to be a safe place, but it's not necessarily made up of everybody that loves God. Everybody that um, comes within the confines of a church is not necessarily right. Just like when you go to the hospital, every doctor is not right. When you hire an attorney, every attorney is not right. And Lord in heaven knows, and all the angels and everybody else, when you go to a mechanic, definitely all the mechanics are not right. Uh, had a mechanic work on the car one time, and somebody else looked at the car and said they took some mat, uh, tape or something like that and taped up something here. I'm thinking that the car was fixed and it was actually taped up. Church that are not right, but nevertheless, you must stand in your faith in God, knowing that the Lord is right and His ways are right and His word is right. But yes, there are predators even in the church, and again, it's not always that they're sexually attracted to you. Realize this, um, my friends, I don't know what that's talking about downloading uh, or oh, is updating. On update, the Lord is trying to update while on the you all it keeps jumping up saying it's trying to upload all my updates on all of my apps um buying that devil of distraction buying that devil of updates coming right now i thought i'd shut that off where it wouldn't do updates unless i allowed it to um but nevertheless the point i'm making just because somebody gets in your face it doesn't mean that they are attracted to you so don't be the type of person the first person comes along and gives you a compliment you're ready to jump somewhere and get married or ready to jump into bed. Sometimes people really are just trying to pull you down, especially if you're a man or woman that, you know, you're like, hey, I just want to be right. I'm, I want to get my life right with God. I want to do uh, God's will for my life. I want to sell out to him. And, and yes, Lord, yes, Lord, whatever you want. And you make up in your mind, you're really going to do the right thing. There are people, even with the confines of the church, different things in order to try to bring you down but don't allow people to bring you down have some discernment have some determination in your mind be like joseph that said hey you know this lady is trying to seduce me and i'm, I'm gonna get away from this situation because she's not right and she doesn't have a right spirit so again everyone that gets in your face is not necessarily attracted to you some people are just simply there to bring you down um Number two, the scripture talks about certain things um, that sex is forbidden. Leviticus 18, 19, do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. I think that's pretty self-explanatory right there. It says what it says. It is what it is. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19, that's where you'll find that scripture. The Bible also talks against same gender sex. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, because that is detestable. Now, I do realize that many people within the LGBT community, um, especially those that are uh, scholars when it comes to scripture, have sought to go to scriptures like Leviticus, like Romans chapter 1, like the scripture in Corinthians that talks about such were some of you when it refers to homosexuals. And they will state that what these passages are dealing with, and again, this is the argument that's coming from uh, that community, and um, again, there's an agenda that is attached to it. And in that agenda and in that mistranslation of Scripture, they basically state that when the Bible says do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, that is detestable. They're saying that's talking about uh, basically prostitution or talking about a situation where there is no love or relationship involved, and they will say that is not talking about an actual loving relationship between two uh, consenting adults. But I think the scripture is pretty plain there when it states, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That's pretty plain and simple, and it says that is detestable. That is the law of God. Now, what you're going to find is, I'm reading from Leviticus, and Quick Bible quiz for those that are, are watching. What are the first five books of the Bible known as? What are the first five books of the Bible known as? Let me see. Will somebody answer that right quick? Ah, uh, you're moving too slow. Come on, saints. Going once, going twice. Well, I know, first of all, there's a, 
Social media has me on a two-minute delay. They don't know what I'm going to say, and um, you'd be surprised of the censorship uh, that comes from social media. And I've had to argue with them a couple of times, and I'm like, you know, I, I didn't call them foolish, but I said, you, you, you're crazy. If you're looking at a title, but you're not really listening at the content of what I'm saying, I'm just teaching a Bible study, so there's no need of trying to think that I'm, you know, some kind of terrorist or something like that. Um, so I know that there's a two-minute delay. Yeah, book of, there you go. Uh, Ligur Heron Jr. stated it, the Pentateuch. Good, 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 good. Um, the Pentateuch, that's the first five books of the Bible, and it is attributed to Moses. Now, you've heard me state this before. You can look it up. Again, anything I say, look it up. Don't just take my word for it. This is Bible study. This is a discussion. I'm not the know-it-all, you know, and I've been called that, Mr. Know-it-all. Um, uh, I've been called worse things, too. But I want you to really look that up and, 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 and know it for yourself. But you've heard me state many times that really Job is the oldest book in the Bible, not Genesis. Genesis records the earliest um, uh, events of history, but it's not necessarily the oldest book. The oldest book written was Job. Um, but Pen the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Moses, we believe, learned all of what he learned by revelation. Of course, when he went up to the top of Mount Sinai slash Mount Horeb, when he went to the mountain, God gave him the revelation of creation and the covenants and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs and all of that. Um, that was given to him uh, uh, from God. But as you go through scripture, you will find out that God instructs Moses and instructs those early believers <clears throat> and says, okay, I'm bringing you out from the Egyptians and I'm taking you into this uh, land. And if you remember, the word was spoken to Abraham that your people are going to get this land but their wickedness has not really reached the level that it is going to reach yet when I'm going to send um, judgment. And so later on, after you're dead and gone, your descendants are going to become slaves in a foreign land, and they're going to come and they're going to take this land. Long story short, one of the main reasons why the Canaanites, Gergeshites, Hivites, all these different individuals were cast out of what is known as the promised land was because of their wickedness. And when you study Leviticus, and it, it's a book, Leviticus is a book that's almost like the first chapter of Matthew. For many people that really don't have an interest in scripture, it can become very dull or boring for lack of a better term. Because when you read through Leviticus, you know, cut the lamb this way, cut the turtle dove's head off this way, and cut, you know, and people are like, is this a butcher um, instruction book or, or what is this? But understand, Leviticus is laying down the laws of God when it comes to how to approach God is really talking about, all right, you've come out in Exodus. Now in Leviticus, we're going to teach you how to approach a holy God and how you can receive what God has for you. Deliverance is not just coming out because a lot of times we're bringing folks out. We do a good job at bringing people out. But like we learned in the evangelism class, it's not so much just bringing people out. You have to take them into something. We're, 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 we're great at praying the sinner's prayer working with you on the altar, you get to live, and that's it. Uh, but in our evangelism class, we literally learned about discipleship. Jesus took three years walking and talking and living with his followers to show them this is how you are to live. This is the lifestyle that you are to practice. And so in Leviticus, the Lord is literally saying, do you know why I've cast out the Canaanites and all of that? They were doing all of these things. They were having sex with their aunt. They were having sex with their daughter-in-law. They were having sex with their brother. They were having sex with their dad and their uncle and their granddad and animals and everything like that and men with men. and women. I mean, it was just totally crazy. And God said, it is an abomination. It is detestable. So for us to come in and all of a sudden think, and again, for those that think they're so smart, well, the Bible is, is, is irrelevant. Listen, this, this book has been around for thousands of years. I know you may say, well, um, you know, just because it's been around for thousands of years, it doesn't mean it's right. But I would rather trust something that has been around for the last, at least with the New Testament, the last 2,000 years versus someone that just was born maybe 50, 60 years ago. And all of a sudden now you're Mr. Know-it-all or Mrs. Know-it-all. The Bible is right and somebody is wrong. The Bible is right. And it says 
in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. So since we mention sex with animals, the scripture also talks against bestiality in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. And so with that in mind, if there perhaps is somebody that is watching right now, that that is something that you are doing, that is a spirit of perversion. And I would encourage you to get spiritual help as well as psychological help because there's um, uh, sexual deviant behaviors and sexual deviant psychological issues that people have. And that's something that really we need to deal with in the church. I, I really like the fact um, that the late Oral Roberts, when he opened up Oral Roberts University, many of you may remember that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, across from the Maybe Center and across from the main campus, there was the hospital that he sought to build. And there, if you remember, were two praying hands. Matter of fact, I think they were on the main campus as well. And the the symbolism of the praying hands was the fact that to bring deliverance to individuals, to really get them delivered from the bondage of sickness, um, medicine is not of the devil. Medicine is something that can be used to help these people receive healing. And so they can be healed through merging, working together with prayer, deliverance, the gifts of the spirit, the anointing, and with medicine. I believe it's the same way when it comes to so many people with dealing with psychological issues. In the church, we have mastered looking the part. I mean, you can't beat the saints dressing. You can't beat the I don't. I don't care if you go to a church like Church of God in Christ where we're more conservative and you have the ladies in the hats and the men in the fancy suits and all of that. Or even if you go to a casual church, you know, there's don't let these casual people fool you. They say some of those tennis shoes can run you, uh, you know, $1,500 for a fancy pair of, 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 of tennis shoes and these fancy shirts and everything. So even for those that dress casually, it doesn't necessarily mean cheap. And so we've mastered the fact of putting on, to be honest, a facade. We looked apart. We talked apart. We know how to talk in tongues. Um, when you come to church now, um, Lord have mercy, they're still ringing the doorbell. Um, when you come to church now, um, there's the setting. And, and, and here's the thing. Let me say this. Let me say this. I know we have now churches that have, you know, smoke machines, lights, and all of that. Can I be honest with you? That's really nothing new. That's really nothing new. Back in the day when they first created um, church facilities, and you have the early Roman Catholic church cathedrals, a lot of the people were not able to read. They were not able to understand and comprehend scripture. So the building was built in such a way to give you this aura of heaven that when you walked into this building, you were walking from the uh, uh, common into the sacred. So therefore, many of you remember old churches used to have steps that just went way up to get into the church. They stopped that because so many people, you know, you get older and this with, uh, 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 what do you call that, um, arthritis and all, it's hard to get up those steps. But the steps were showing you that you were going to a higher place and you walk in, there's the stained glass windows with all the pictures of the apostles and Jesus. And then in the Roman Catholic churches, you had the incense and the smell was to give you a sense of you're in a sacred place. So it appealed to your, your sight, uh, your, your, your hearing and your smell, your sense of touch when you touch the wafers and you're taking of the um, uh, body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's nothing new when it comes to trying to have a setting that puts you into the mood. You know, modern churches will put, try to put you in the mood when it comes to worship, dim the lights and have slow music on, almost uh, hypnotize you into a certain state of mind where you can get into worship. That is not necessarily anything new. But if we don't watch it, you will end up making a facade. It's, it's one thing to set the mood, but if God is not there, it's one thing to set the mood, but if your heart is really not towards worship, you're really just putting on an act. And so what has happened, we're so good at putting on this facade that help is not really occurring for people that are in need of deliverance. You know, there are so many people in sexually deviant behaviors behind closed doors. I'm talking about in marriages and outside of marriages. And, and you'd be surprised the kind of things that are taking place. And somebody may get caught up and get exposed and all of that, and you will have people that are doing far worse that have the attitude, ooh, at least it wasn't me, at least I wasn't caught. You know, 
the thing is, a person should seek help and should seek deliverance. And so the church ought to be a safe place where people can be delivered from these type of things. And yes, there are people that practice this, but Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23 says that is a perversion. Bestiality is a perversion. So if you're involved in perverted behavior, just like Oral Roberts had the medicine along with the prayer, sometimes there's the psychological help that needs to go right along with the prayer and with the deliverance. There's certain personality disorders that people have. And with those personality disorders, um, you can help them that way. And then, of course, there's certain spirits that team up with each other. Um, um, uh, when, you, when you talk about perversion, a lot of times there may be other things that go along uh, 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 with it. Um, deceit, along with the perversion, uh, uh, um, sexual sin, along with that. Um, there's a book that many of you have read before. I would recommend you reading it in the sense of just getting a basic sense of deliverance, but not necessarily like this is the laws and regulation and this is always how it is. But many remember, remember the book from the 80s, I believe it was, Frank and Ida Mae Hammond, Pigs in the Parlor. And it deals with all kinds of different spirits and how to bring deliverance. Now, the theology is not totally correct because in the theology uh, of that particular book, they teach that a Christian uh, can be demon-possessed. Now, I personally don't believe that according to the scriptures. No man can serve two masters. He's either going to serve the one or serve the other. And so you may have a person that appears to be a Christian and wants to be a Christian, and they're demon-possessed, but you can't have God on the throne and the devil on the throne at the same time. Now, maybe you see it that way, but I just don't see it. There's got to be one that's on the throne, and it's either one or the other, God or the devil. In that particular book, they do believe that um, uh, Christians can be possessed, and um, in the book it teaches how to do self-deliverance. I don't know so much about that. The scripture talks about if any two of us uh, would agree is touching anything we ask it shall be done and so we need the prayers of the saints confess your faults one to another the book of James chapter 5 and pray for one another that you may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much and so there is help that is available for those that need deliverance number five pornography um is pornography allowed in the bedroom among a married couple? Maybe there's a married couple that says, hey, we want to spice things up a little bit, so let's put big screens all over the place and yada, yada, yada. Well, according to the word in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, that is forbidden by Scripture. Matthew 5, 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that would be a contradiction of Scripture to have a married um, couple in the room and then they're looking around at big screen TVs at um, everybody else and lusting after that person and that's supposed to spice things up. Well, Hankerson, what, what do we do? You know, um, um, perhaps you have a spouse that has um, uh, erectile dysfunction or something like that and maybe this will help out. Well, if a person has erectile dysfunction, that is a uh, function within the body. That is an illness and so that person needs um, uh, medical help, needs medical help for that. And just like you need medical help for your heart, medical help for your, um, uh, um, your eyes, your eye doctor and everything like that, you need medical help for that as well if that is the particular case. And so bringing in something that is against the Word of God and against Scripture, um, that's really not going to help a situation. You're really going to make the situation worse because what's going to end up happening, um, you know, you're looking at... Um, Susie on the on the big screen or Bob on the uh, big screen. Uh, uh, the lady's looking at Bob and the man looking at Susie and all of that. And that's going to get in your spirit. So when you're supposed to be focused on your spouse, you're going to be focused on Susie. Uh, so Matthew 5, 28 again teaches against it. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's a heart issue. And so we know even for single people, you need to stay away from that altogether because it's a heart issue. The heart is wicked. It's desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Your, your, your heart, it's, it's a battle to keep it pure. Um, Joyce Meyer wrote a book talking about battlefield of the mind. Um, if I was to write another book, um, and some of you all bought my book. You can get it out on, on Amazon. I want to see how many of you all go tonight to Amazon. It's still available somebody ordered it just the other day. Um, but if I was to write another book, one of the type of topics would be uh, Battlefield of the Heart. We're always talking about the mind and focus on that, but my goodness, to keep that heart 
clean and pure. There's always, you know, bitterness that wants to get in. There's all these arrows that are constantly shooting at you. Oh, here's unforgiveness. Oh, here's hatred. And oh, here's strife. And here's jealousy. And here's envy. It's a battle uh, uh, to keep that heart pure. And a lot of people just have the sense of, ooh, I'm just going to let God deal with it. God's going to handle it. That's why I have the Holy Ghost. No, he says in James, faith without works is dead. There's a part that you play. God does what he's supposed to do, and then there's a part that you're supposed to play as well. Now, there's no work that you can do to save yourself, so you can hang that up. You know, Jesus is the only one that his blood was completely perfect and could atone for all of our sins, so you might as well hang that up trying to save yourself. You cannot do it. Uh, by grace are you saved through faith. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's all him. But there is a work that we do in cooperating with God to live this life. Because again, the evangelism class was so glad, so good. I wish you all could have been in that class. Because one of the things that was taught was Jesus didn't just say, you know, go out and save people in the world. But he also said, make disciples. We're so good at getting folks saved. But he said, make disciples. Whatsoever things I have taught you, those things you're to teach others that they also, um, you know, uh, might fear. So well, I'm merging scriptures there. Basically, he said, uh, uh, go, into all, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And uh, whatsoever I commanded you, you should command that to them um, as well. And so that's what's supposed to happen. It's not so much just, ooh, I got saved and I got it. I'm straight. I got it. I got it. Something about the Holy Ghost I can't explain. Well, the reason you can't explain is because you haven't been discipled. You, 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 what is this? I feel deep down inside. And when you got to ask what it is, you need to be discipled if you don't know what that is. And I, as much as I love that song, what is this? Well, after 30 years, you ought to know what it is. You know, and talking about I got it and I just can't explain it. After a certain number of time, being in the Word of God and studying God's Word, uh, you should be able to explain. The Bible tells you that you should be able to explain the hope that lies within you. So again, it's very important that we follow the Word of God and keep this heart pure. So pornography really isn't so much just a sexual thing. It is a heart thing. It's a heart thing to keep this heart pure so that nothing can be in this heart that would cause us to have a break in our relationship with God. We never want anything to, to hinder our relationship with God. Saints, that's what it's all about. Now, number six, another thing that is forbidden as far as a sexual act is, of course, sex outside of marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2, and especially those that are single, because I know some of the single saints said, well, this doesn't pertain to me because I'm not married. No, listen, share. I need everybody to start sharing this because I'm going to get into this about single people saying, well, as long as we don't go all the way, uh, we're okay. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. Now, for the matters he wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's Paul talking. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own, own husband. So, you do have... Uh, let's deal with this. Let's, let's just deal with the nitty-gritty about this. You do have... Um, Christians, you do have preachers that are sharing now that sex outside of marriage is okay. Um, you have other people, sex therapists and um, modern day preachers. The reason I say modern day, I would be considered more of a traditional preacher. I, I just stick, I feel safe just sticking with the Word of God. That's, that's what I feel safe doing. And um, I'm more traditional, people would say, in my interpretation of Scripture. There are other people that take the Scriptures more as a book of principles, but not necessarily a day-by-day -day guideline that guides every aspect of your book. There's many people that are um, considered to be Christians and preachers that um, look at the Bible as a book of principles, and they may look at the Koran as a book of principles and other um, spiritual teachers. And just kind of, you know, you follow whatever is that best, best path for you. I stick with the traditional view of Scripture that all sex outside of marriage is wrong. There are some that will say, well, Hankerson, you've got to test drive a car before you know um, that you'll even uh, want that car. Because they'll say, Hankerson, you, you don't just walk into the um, car dealership and there's a Model S on the floor, or uh, you put in your order for what you want in the car, or you even buy a car 
off the lot that is using, you never have test driven it. You, you don't know how it drives. You just read about it, you looked at it, but you don't know how it drives. So shouldn't you test drive the car um, before you get the car? Because you may get the car and get down the line and realize that something is wrong. Um, let's give you an example. Let's just deal with the nitty gritty. For example, maybe there's a couple um, that's engaged and um, it's not known until after they get married that the man has erectile dysfunction or the lady um, has been, I'm just using different scenarios, uh, has been sexually abused in her childhood. And now that she's married, she doesn't want to have nothing to do with sex because anytime she gets touched, it reminds her of what she went through in her um, childhood. So now there's a battle. You'd be surprised. There's two things that couples fight on all the time. Married couples fight on all the time. Sex and money. And a lot of times it's because it's not enough of either of it. Uh, the sex or the money. I guess it's, you may consider this kind of raw, but I'm just dealing with facts and figures, you know, in, in, in the study of the Word of God tonight. And so people will say, well, that's a problem, Hankerson, because, you know, none of that stuff was disclosed ahead of time. That's why I really feel that no one should get married without premarital counseling. And in premarital counseling, things like this with a professional, uh, not a Jack Lake preacher, not, not somebody you went to the, uh, my wife and I, we went through Vegas one time. We drove to Vegas from Los Angeles and uh, went to the restaurants and, and all of that and caught a flight back to St. Louis. And we looked, I said, look, lady, hey, that's a, some kind of love chapel where you can just go in and get, get married just like that. No one should get married without professional counseling. And again, I'm not talking about a Jack Lake preacher. I'm talking about a preacher that actually has an established uh, counseling uh, format where you go through different lessons. Somebody may say, well, Hankerson, do you do that anymore? Uh, I don't really do that like I used to in the early days of the ministry. I have people in place um, to do that. Um, but those type of things, finances, sex, um, dealing with relatives, all of those things should be dealt with in the premarital counseling uh, because it's during that time that you learn whether, you know, you believe that this is going to work or not. Because a lot of times people are infatuated, not necessarily in love, they're just infatuated or they're just ready to get married. Some people get married because somebody else got married. Well, my friend got married and I can't let them get married and I don't get married, so I'm a, that's the most foolish thing in the world. Why would you do that? Why would you get married and bind up your life because somebody else uh, has got married? That is a foolish thing. Um, you know, so... As far as somebody, now here's what hurt us. Here's what hurt us. Here's what hurt us. As much as some of you all loved um, former President uh, William Clinton, uh, when he made that statement in regard to Monica Lewinsky and said, I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me right. I remember like it was yesterday. I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. It totally changed the mindset of a whole generation. I knew it. When that statement went across the television, I said, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? A whole new generation is going to state that, well, we didn't go all the way. And so since we didn't go all the way, we did not commit fornication. I'm so glad for the Bible. The reason I'm so glad for the Bible, God is smart. I mean, he is, he is so brilliant. He has the answer before you even try to figure out how to weasel your way out of what his principles are. In 1 Corinthians 7... Verse 1 and 2, the King James says, uh, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Now, that's what it says in King James. It uses the term fornication. Proper translation would be considered sexual immorality. Greek word is actually pornea. And so what that does, that pertains to all kinds of sexual sin. So that's why the most proper translation, <clears throat> excuse me, would be sexual immorality. So sexual immorality covers all of the rest areas and all of the different sites to see before you get to the destination. I'm talking allegorically because the final destination, of course, would be sexual intercourse. And some people will say, well, as long as we didn't go all the way, well, if you go halfway, if you go a third of the way, if you go three-fifths of the way, if you go 99% of the way, 
All of that is covered up under sexual immorality. And Paul basically said in the early part of that verse, 1 Corinthians 7, don't touch each other. That's the best thing. Um, and you really need to know your limitations. There's a lot of um, um, engaged couples or people that are dating, uh, do a lot of kissing and things like that. You really need to be careful and know the boundary because one thing will lead to another. The flesh has, and when I say the flesh, in that sense, I'm not talking about um, your sin nature. Because realize when the Bible talks about flesh, uh, a lot of times it's different from what we're talking about. You know, this, this, is, this, this body is neutral. This is flesh. But when the scripture refers to flesh, it's talking about that sinful nature, that nature that is against God. But when I'm talking about flesh now, I'm talking about the physical body. And your physical body basically is a neutral house. It has different cravings and things like that. Yes, it has sexual cravings. That It has cravings to eat. It has cravings to uh, of, of thirst. Your body will want food when it's not even um, necessary, not even hungry. And so it has different cravings. And so if you take it and put it into a situation, one thing can lead to another. You know, you know, it's, it's two o'clock in the morning, um, got the lights dim, got the um, uh, candles burning, and it's not Barry Manilow. What's the name of that guy with the deep voice? Um, what's the name of that guy? Practice what you preach. You all know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Barry, whatever his name is, I think that's the case. Um, and, and you're talking about where we're having a prayer meeting at two o'clock in the morning. We're setting the candles so that the Holy Spirit can come. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a spirit that comes in all right. But you just have Barry White. Thank you so much, Sister Sharice Jackson. Now go and repent for saying that. You too, uh, Sister Ike. All of y'all. Look at look at you all. And so, <laughs> Sister Heron, I'm a nasty white. Yeah, Barry White. So, um, and, 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 and that's another subject. If you want to hear about um, music in the bedroom and all, I did another lesson on, on that many, many months ago, probably about a year or so ago. You can listen to that. But again, um, you're putting yourself into a situation where one thing can lead to the next. And you may say, I'm strong, I can handle this. But realize this, many times people in the church can be some of the worst folks when it comes to sexual sin. Um, I believe it was one of the, I won't call the name, but one of the major singers that's dead and gone now, he's an R&B singer. This R&B singer went to a very famous church in a very famous city. I won't call the church name. I won't call the city name. So this singer went to the most famous, not most famous, but a famous church. And this R&B singer, of course, had a background in the church, but he's an R&B singer, uh, made this statement about church folks. He said, church folks are some of the biggest freaks that you can find any place. They will do all kinds of things that folks even outside of the church will not even think of doing. And so I don't know what term they call, call it now. I'm kind of giving my age now. They used to call it uh, freaks way back when, folks that were just, you know, into some of everything. Bishop Blake says this, you have bisexuals and you have trisexuals. He says a trisexual is somebody that just try anything. And it's a shame. I hear some of you saying, yeah, that's, that's true. That's a bad reputation to have that the biggest freaks in the world. Again, I don't know what the word is now. That's what it was years ago. Um, you find in the church. And there are people that know, you know, if you want to get a girl, you want to get a guy, whatever, just go to the church. And that's where you find whatever you want to have. The church house would be a church house and known as a church house and not known as a meat house. That's a shame to have that kind of reputation. So again, what you don't want to do is put yourself into that kind of situation where one thing will lead to the next. Oh, Hankerson, but my flesh, I'm just burning. That's why, again, I go back to the evangelism class where we didn't talk just about getting saved. We talked about being disciple. Many people in the church, some of you, are struggling in your walk with God because you never were discipled. You never were discipled. You, you, you uh, grew up in church. You've been around church. You know church. You went to new members class, and all churches have new members class. Some have discipleship classes. 
but even discipleship really isn't so much even just a class. Jesus didn't put on a class. He said, follow me. Drop your nets and follow me. And I want you to follow me. And they followed him three years. And in following him them three years, have you ever noticed you've never read anything beside Judas and besides Peter, you know, having his little anger fit and besides him and Paul kind of falling out, you never read about no scandals with the apostles. And these are 12 men. These are 12 sure enough men, you know, fishermen and, and, and tax collectors, businessmen, corporate leaders and things like that you never hear about. Well, it wasn't recorded. Well, they, the Bible records everything else. It records Solomon and all of his wives and concubines. It records uh, uh, Demas forsaking the Lord and loving this present world. It talks about everything else. The Bible is a very straight to the point book. It does not beat around the bush. And so if there was the case of that, it would have been recorded. But you don't find that. How is it that those people could be so solid and stable in their walk with God? The reason why they could be stable in their walk with God was because, saints of God, they were discipled by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's how you can live a righteous life where you don't end up into a lot of sexual sin. How have I been able to stand and live you know, this life all these, these years? I was discipled. And really, disciple is, is you following Christ. You're learning Christ. And Paul said this. Here's how I want you to be disciple. Follow me as I follow Christ. Instead of patterning ourselves after everybody else, let's pattern ourselves after Christ and then find godly men, godly women. No, they're not Jesus. No, they're not Christ. No, they're not Holy Ghost Jr. But watch their life and eat the meat and spit out the bones. Anybody that you watch, you, you watch them long enough, you're going to see some things you don't like. You watch yourself, you're going to see some things you don't like. But look at those good points and apply those good points to your life. Apply those good principles to your life. Prayer, devotion, righteousness, kindness, meekness, all these types of things. So again, according to the scriptures, sex outside of marriage is wrong. So if it's, again, if it's going halfway, two-thirds of the way, 99% of the way, ten, well, Hank is in just 1% one, one of the way, leave it alone. Put that in the comment section. Leave it alone. Some of you need to call five people tonight because you know good and well there's some folks that's close to you and maybe yourself. <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, be accountable to each other. You know, you go out and fornicate together. You go out and, and do what you do on Friday night, then come on, come to church on Sunday and, and, and perpetrate. Instead of covering each other and, and, and being accountable to each other for sin, be accountable to each other for what's right. Let your brother and sister know, no, that's not right. I'm not going to do that. And you don't need to be doing that. And if you have an addiction, yes, there are sexual addictions. They can be broken by the power of God. You don't have to live that kind of way. You don't have to do it. Now, people will tell you, don't do it. But I'm telling you, you don't have to do it. Why is that? You've been created in the image of God. And nothing should control you, not even sex. The only thing that should have control over your life is the power of God. Nothing should have the mastery over you. Paul said, I take mastery over my body. You shouldn't allow your body to have control over you. And um, Kirk Franklin was at the um, convocation the other day. And remember years ago, he talked about his struggle with pornography. And I remember in that um, discussion he was having, I think it was on the Oprah Winfrey show, uh, he and his wife were there. He said he would be um, in his home late at night, and he said he had threw those, at, back there in those days, they had the dirty magazines and everything like that, he'd thrown them in the trash, and he said late at night he couldn't even sleep. Those things were calling him from the trash. to come in. That's an addiction. Anytime something is controlling you like that, that is a spirit and demon of addiction, and you need to let that filthy thing know you are not going to control my life. It has nothing to do with sex. The, the devil could care less about you having sex. That's he is, he is out, let me tell you what his, his um, aim is to do. Leviticus, Leviticus uh, St. John 10 and 10, steal, kill, and destroy. He care less about what you drink. He care less about who you sleep with. That doesn't mean a hill of beans to the devil. He, he doesn't care anything about that. The only thing he's out to do, that's a means to an end. If I can destroy you, that's what I'm out to do. That's what he says. I, I'm steal, kill, and destroy. So realize this. He'll mask up everything, and he, he knows exactly what you like because he has demons around. He has a, has a kingdom of darkness. They watch, they observe. 
But I've come to tell you tonight, you have power over that. Nothing should have the mastery over you. Number seven, sex with another person's spouse is forbidden. Leviticus 18 and 6, do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. So for those of you that go to these conventions and have wife swapping, I had some bishops laugh at me when I use that term. And the reason why you're laughing is because you're guilty of it. That's what the problem is. And, and, and I can tell when you with a, a nervous laugh. I remember I took some psychology, too. And so um, people say, all right, let's spice things up. You know, you sleep with this one's spouse, and I'll sleep with your spouse. That's totally forbidden in the Scripture, according to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 16. So all this trying to spice things up, oh, you're going to spice it all right up in hell. That's what's going to end up happening, because you're going to be so hot that um, you're going to need some spicing. Number eight bringing other people into the marriage bed. You'd be surprised. They call those threesomes. There's preachers <laughs> that have sexual addictions and take pleasure in bringing other folks into the marriage bed that are not their spouse. Ephesians 5.31 says this, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. It doesn't say be united to your wife and a, and a, and a, and a lady from the church all at the same time. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say sit there and watch your wife have sex with someone or watch your husband have sex with someone, bring someone in of the same sex. All these kind of, it may sound like, Hankerson, you just talked, this junk is going on in the church. And I'm not talking about the true church of Jesus Christ. You know, there's the invisible church and the visible church. The invisible church are those that know the name of Christ, those that belong to him, and those that will be ready for him when he comes. But the visible church is just, I mean, there's some everything. That's why Jesus had to say, let the wheat and the tear grow together. You know, the kingdom of God is as a mustard seed. You plant it, and then when it grows up, it's this largest thing, and all of a sudden the birds that's in the air, they, they nest in it. And so you're going to have all kinds of things happening in the church. We talk about everything else. Why aren't we talking about this? It's a sin, and there's people that are doing it. And it's against the word of God. Threesomes, that is a sin. Ephesians 5.31, for this reason will a man leave his father and mother and only be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So again, be careful of all this thing about spicing things up um, in the marriage. And again, you, some of you have questions. What are you talking about? We need to spice things up, Hankerson. What about whips and chains and candles? We'll deal with that here in just a few minutes, okay? We're getting there. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished, but I'm getting there. Well, why will you save it till the end? We're just, we're going to get there. Number nine, cases where a spouse has been previously abused. How do you deal with that? Because there are some people um, that were abused in childhood, abused sexually. And those of you watching on Instagram, you're about to go off in the next one minute and 45 seconds. You need to switch on over, come to my Facebook fan page, my Facebook personal page, Twitter, as well as Periscope, because you're going off on one minute and 36 seconds. And in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about um, oral sex, anal sex, all those kind of things here in the next few minutes. And so you got to get on over and you know, watch this and see what the Word of God has to say. So cases where spouses have been previously abused. Some people have been abused, and they get married, and in marriage, they, sex is the last thing that's on their mind. They'd rather not do that at all, you know, once a year, maybe once every two years, once every five years, whatever, or not at all completely. Um, in cases like that, deliverance is needed. Ephesians 4 and 2 says, complete, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. It's going to take some understanding. That's a major problem. You, you really, you're really going to need some marital counseling, going to need some help with that, and even some personal counseling with that, some deliverance, um, some major fasting and prayer, some major time in the Word of God to really deal with that. And the reason why is, of course, you know, you have the other spouse that has a normal, natural um, sexual drive. You have the other spouse saying, no, never, you know, um, that's not going to happen. So the person that has the normal sex drive, it says here in Ephesians 4 and 2, you got to be patient and bear with one another in love. And remember your vows. Remember your vows that you made on that altar for better. For well, I don't know about that. No, hold on. Just... Don't argue with me now. Let me get my point out. Um, 
don't, you don't, don't talk while I'm talking now, okay? Um, you said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others until death do you part. You made that vow. And now is the time for you to fulfill that vow and to deal with that vow. So it's very important that you're patient and understanding God has trusted you with this responsibility to walk your spouse through deliverance. Well, they don't want deliverance. It, don't you have a prayer life? If you don't have a prayer life, that's where discipleship comes in. God does answer prayer. We talk a lot of things. God can do anything. Only God can do it. Only God can do it. Uh, President Renee Winston, we, we sing that and we say that, but do you really believe it? If we say only God can do it, only God can do it. God can do anything but fail. It's time to put to practice the things that we talk about. So if God can do all these great things and open doors and make ways, guess what? He can bring deliverance in your sexual life and your marriage. He can do anything but fail. And so God has trusted you with the responsibility to help walk that spouse through a time of deliverance so that things can be normal. And for the spouse that has been abused, it's important for you to understand that you made a vow. And sexual relations are part of the marriage relationship. And you need to seek God um, to bring you through that difficult, uh, traumatic experience that you've um, gone through and, and, and realize he, he can do it. He can, he can bring you through. It's, it's going to be difficult. Realize this. I worked for a ministry for 17 years that specialized in dealing with people that have been abused. Joyce Meyer Ministries. I was on staff with her 17 years, serving as a ghostwriter for her, writing her field. Like all these things I'm doing now, I did that 17 years, trained in seminary for it. And so um, I've seen cases. I'll just say it like this. I've seen cases the most horrendous cases that you can ever imagine, things that would break your heart. Little children, you know, that, that now they're grown up, but they were abused in childhood, cried out, God, please stop this from happening, but it happened anyways, and now they're struggling in their faith with God. God, why didn't you stop this? God, why didn't you deal with this? And now they're broken, still broken and shattered, and now they're in a marriage relationship. And now the spouse is having a fit because there's no sex in the relationship. And I mean, just horrendous types of situations. This is going on, saints of God. And we serve a God that can. We serve a God that will. So for those that have been abused, ask God, Lord, help me, help me, help me to deal with this. Help me to deal with all these things that I had to go through. You know, help me to deal with all of this, 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 this brokenness, this sin, this wretchedness. That, that, that came upon me as an innocent person, as just a small child. I mean, that's, to me, that's the most, oh, that's the most, uh, I'm not grabbing my knife, saints. My knife is in, <laughs> I ain't going to tell you where the knife is. But anyways, I'm not grabbing for that. But that's the worst thing. Let me stop balling my fist up. That's the worst thing that you could possibly do is to violate a child, an innocent child. That's nasty, dirty, low-down sin, wretched sin. And, and if you are guilty of something like that, you need not only deliverance, but um, that's breaking the law as well. There's repercussions for that. And it's not something that just needs to be just, you know, well, you know, it happened, whatever. And then you act like nothing um, ever occurred because you're just so concerned about your career and all that. God is going to vindicate. God's going to deal with you. But you, you may have got away, but uh, uh, what do they say? You may have got away but you haven't got over i'll say it like that you haven't got over there is a god that's a god of justice and so it's important for those that are dealing with that type of situation and in the church many times we teach just the spiritual and not the natural you know we teach you how to speak in tongues but you got to know but hopefully we're not teaching how to speak in tongues the holy ghost has to give you that but there's a natural side also you know and um i told you in the early days of my marriage 22 years ago vacation for me was going to a city um, just looking at churches. Oh, there's some, and my wife was so patient. Thank God for Lady Hankerson. She was so patient. <laughs> when I sit back and look at, she didn't complain. Oh, there's, there, I'm like, there's Bishop so-and-so's church. Let's go across town and see this church. Let's go to this service. And she just, I'm, I'm, I'm being as honest as I can possibly be. As honest as an aneurysm. And that's, that's, in, I'm, that's serious and that's honest. She did not complain. She just dealt with that. Um, but I'm sure she prayed. I'm sure she asked God to 
uh, deal with me, and God dealt with me, and now it's nothing to go for us to go to the beach. Now it's not that I'm going to get in the water now. You're not going to get me in that water, but at least we go to the beach and sit there and look at the sunset and all that. Two middle-aged people sitting up there uh, looking. It's just wonderful. And so um, God can change. So for those of you that are in situations like that, I want you to know that God does answer prayer. There is healing for the wounded. There is healing for the broken. You don't have to stay in the condition that you're in any longer. And that's why God sent this program tonight, this webcast, to help you to bring deliverance in your home, in your mind, in your spirit. Like I said, there's a battlefield in the mind, but there's a battlefield in the heart as well. And God can pull out all of those things that the enemy has implanted in that heart. And you shall reap a harvest of blessings if you faint not. My God, Galatians chapter 6, it tells us that let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. The eyes of the Lord are going to and fro and seeking those that he can show himself strong and mighty and pour out his blessings upon. And that's you. So it's not going to stay like this all the time. Don't feel like it's going to stay like this all the time. God can do anything. Only God can do it. And if you don't believe it, God will allow you to get into a situation that only God can do it. No one else can help you. No one else can bring you out but him. He'll allow you to get into that situation. I mean, stuck and almost buried and almost over. And that's when a miracle is necessary. And let me tell you what, God specializes in miracles, even when it comes to your marital relationship. Now, wrapping it up, what about specific sex acts among married couples? People ask about um, anal sex, oral sex, all those kind of things. Listen, um, specifically going into all those types of details, you'll have to really um, seek the Lord as far as your marriage relationship. You know, there's people chain themselves up and all that kind of thing. Listen, Hebrews 13 and 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral. What the word of God says there is that that marriage bed needs to be kept pure. So anything that is not pure, anything that is not righteous should not be brought into that marriage bed because it says God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral. It does say in 1 Corinthians 7 and 4 that the wife's body was made for the man, the man's body was made for the wife. It does say that, 1 Corinthians 7 and 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. So look at that scripture, but then take it through the prism of Hebrews 13 and 4. It should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. Now, a person being abused and not being able to have normal sexual relations because they can live without sex is totally different from someone else dealing with a married couple now, a man and a woman. Let, let me say this when I say couple, married, man and woman, married, because that's the only thing that scripture condones. It doesn't condone any other type of marital relationship. Um, so a husband and a wife or one spouse wants to do something um, quote-unquote freaky and whatever that might be and the other spouse is not comfortable with it when you force somebody to start doing something that they're uncomfortable with and then you try to use 1 Corinthians 7 and 4 I got authority over your body yeah but it also says keep the marriage bed pure and it also says be completely humble and gentle and patient bearing with one another in love and so to force somebody to do something that they don't feel comfortable doing, you're really crossing the line where you're getting into um, a lack of love for that person. And love is not so much just a, a, a oozy-goosy feeling. Love literally means devotion and loyalty to one another. You're being disloyal when you start forcing someone to do something that they're not comfortable doing. So uh, in that particular case, I can't give you advice, but I would encourage you as a marriage couple, married couple to sit down and discuss um, what you consider to be acceptable, what you consider not to be acceptable. The wrong thing for you to do, and it would be sin for you to say, well, if I can't get biscuits in this house, then what I'll do, I'll stay married to you, but I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to get my biscuits, you know, every other day. 
uh, or every day, once a week, whatever, and then I'll stay at home. You're wrong for doing that, and that's a sin, and God's going to get you for it because that's why it said, again, saints, I can't say it enough. God is brilliant. <laughs> when you try to find a loophole, boom, he's, he's got you right there. So he says marriage should be honored by all the marriage bed kept pure. So for a person that says, well, if I can't get the biscuits here, and I, I just made up that term, biscuits, whatever you want to use, that's fine. Uh, if I can't get the biscuits here, I'm going down the street, and I'll do it down there, and I'll make sure I come back home. But it says God will judge the adulterer and the sexual immoral. God is going to judge that person for doing such things. Now, the Bible is very sensual, is very sensual in many different passages. Let's look at Song of Solomon um, chapter 4. We'll just read the whole chapter there, and it will show you that in the scriptures they were very um, sensual individuals that dealt with body, the body parts and things like that. And so, again, when you read that, you will see that the married couples enjoyed one another, but going back to Hebrews 13 and 4, there were certain boundaries. Song of Solomon, starting verse 1 through 5. You're so beautiful, my darling, so beautiful, and your dove eyes are veiled. By your hair as it flows and shimmers. By, B-Y, not B-U-Y. So I know people go to the um, ethnic store and buy here, but that's not what it's referring to. Like a flock of goats in the distance, streaming down a hillside in the sunshine. Your smile is generous and full, expressive, strong, and clean. Your lips are jewel red. Your mouth elegant and, and inviting. Your veiled cheeks soft and radiant. The smooth lie, lines of your neck command notice. All heads turn in awe and admiration. Your breasts are like fawns, twins of a gazelle, grazing among the first spring flowers. The sweet, fragrant curves of your body, the soft spice contours of your flesh. Invite me and I come, I stay until dawn breathes its light and night slips away. You're beautiful from head to toe, my dear love, beautiful beyond compare, absolutely flawless. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride, leave Lebanon behind and come. Leave your high mountain hideaway, abandon your wilderness seclusion where you keep company with lions and panthers. Guard your safety. You captured my heart, dear friend. You looked at me, and I fell in love. One looked my way, and I was hopelessly in love. How beautiful your love, dear, dear friend. Far more pleasing than the fine, rare wine. Your fragrance more exotic than select spices. The kisses of your lips are honey, my love. Every syllable you speak, a delicacy to savor. Your clothes smell like the wild outdoors, the ozone scent of high mountains. Dear lover and friend, you are a secret garden. A private and a pure fountain, body and soul, you are paradise. A whole orchard of succulent fruits, ripe apricots, peaches, oranges, and my God, nut trees and cinnamon and all scented woods, mint and lavender, and all herbs aromatic. A garden fountain, sparkling and splashing, fed by spring waters from the Lebanon mountains. Wake up, north wind, get moving, south wind. Breathe on my garden, fill the air with spice fragrance. Oh, let my lover enter his garden. Yes, let him eat the fine ripe fruits and so they were talking about going to the garden and uh yes i'm <laughs> for those that for those that are like whoo wee what's he reading from song of solomon chapter four the message bible all of the verses in the scripture what that's basically saying is that uh you know they were very sensual in the bible in regard to their marital relationship so there's nothing wrong with that a person should enjoy going home let me tell you what for these people, preachers, pastors, whoever, um, that like to stay away from home, stay away from your spouse, something is wrong. I love going home. That is actually my, my paradise. That is my um, um, sacred place. That's my safe place. Being around my family, that's my uh, safe place. And really, if you don't have that, you should pray. You know, Lord, let my house be a sanctuary. Let my home be a sanctuary. It used to be a time that our family just loved to get away. I mean, many of you have seen us um, in different cities and on the highway down through the years. I mean, my family, uh, we've driven driven in the car now to, to probably 48 of the, no, yeah, 48 of the 50 states. Now, I've been to Alaska, we ha and I haven't been, none of us have been to Hawaii, but I've been to Alaska, so I've been to 49 uh, states, but the rest of the family has been to 48 uh, states. And it was just wonderful going around to see different things. The Golden Gate Bridge, the Twin Towers before they were taken down, the um, Mount Rushmore, the um, uh, Liberty Bell, all those things. I remember one night, my wife and I, we were driving in Philadelphia, 
or driving driving up the East Coast, actually, Interstate 95, we got to Philadelphia, and all oh, there was a Liberty Bell. We're waking up the kids, wake up, wake up! And it's about 2 o'clock in the morning because we're trying to make it to Maine. And so the kids are looking, trying to wipe their eyes, and they gave us the dirtiest looks. You all woke us up to look at a dumb bell? <laughs> Why would you do something like that? But we wanted them to see the significance of all of these different uh, uh, sites. However, down through the years, it's just evolved in our house that coming home, being at home, is someplace that's safe. Why are you walking the streets all night? Why are you going from place to place? Why are you in a, in a, in a place that's, that, that's not your home? Why are you there in a hotel room with somebody that's not your spouse? Why would you do something like that? Why would you enter into same-sex relationships or uh, sexual relationships with people that are uh, not your spouse or underage individuals? Why would you do something like that? Why would you destroy all of what it is that God has invested in you? God has invested so much in you. So for those of you that are bound with sexual sin, let me tell you what, there is hope and through the power and the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Word of God doesn't just deal with angels and heaven and streets of gold. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it's going to be in some glad morning when this life is over. Listen, I don't have to sit up here and be miserable every single day of my life and just worrying and hoping and praying that one day I'm going to get out of here. You know, even the slaves, when they were in slavery, they said, up above my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. They found solace and strength and peace in their relationship with God. All hell was breaking loose all around them. But they said, in spite of it all, I can hear some music. God is good. God woke me up this morning, put shoes on my feet and clothes on my back. So listen, it's not so much about just dying and going to heaven. God wants you to live an abundant life down here, and you don't have to be bound by anything. Nothing should have the mastery over you. Pornography should not have the mastery over you. When something, a fornication, adultery should not have the mastery over you. When something gets you up out of your bed at two o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep and you've got to run, let me tell you what, saints, I'm a living witness that God will keep, keep you. God has kept me all of my life. God's been good to me. All of my life, God has kept me through my college years. And you know, them college years can get real, real, real crazy. I was 2,000 miles away from home to do whatever I wanted to do. But I just had a mind. I just want to live for God. And uh, some of you have experienced that, those wild years and all of that in college. And all. But I'm telling you, God kept me. I saw, and I went to, well, I'm not going to tell you what school I went to now. But uh, <laughs> I'm saying all this. Let me just say, I saw a whole lot of things. You know, people that are, you know, in the church and also, you know, this a lot of people, this is their first time away from home and they just went buck wild. And I thank God some of them people got their lives together and many are doing great things for God right now. And so that's why I say no situation is too hopeless. You may have hooped it up. I know that's an old term and, and did a lot of things that's out there, sown your wild oats. But God is saying you can come back home. You can come back home no matter what it is that you have done. You can come back home. I need to finish um, but, um, I can probably take two questions if you can ask, ask them right quickly before, um, you know, Facebook has me on this, um, <clears throat> two minute delay and I get some holy water while you're doing it, but I can probably take a couple questions and thank you all so much for tuning in. You want to come to my church this weekend for your birthday, the Lord's will road trip. Come on. Will I be in town? Yes. Yes, let me check the camera. Because one thing about my church, um, they threaten me. Yes, I will be in town this coming weekend. Um, yeah, my church threatened me. Um, I travel so much, and I started to travel on Sundays, and they threatened me. I said, you can't tell me not to travel. I said, that's a general board member. That's who I, They said, we don't care who it is. You, you tell them that you got a church. And so I try to make sure that I'm here definitely on Sundays and on Tuesdays. Um... Brother Gaston, here's the problem. Let me see, can I open up your question? Because it won't, uh, let's see, can we see the whole thing? Can, can you ask it in, a, in, in, in two short sentences? Because it's only let me read one, two, three, four lines, and I can't expand on the question. 
you're going to need good holy water after reading these comments. Oh, Lord, I haven't even seen the comments, Sister Taylor Shante. What have you all been talking about? You did it a few weeks ago. I mean, you all had, I'm sitting here trying to teach a webcast, and you all are in your own little world. And that's why I kept looking up, like, what are you talking about? I, I didn't even see the comments tonight. All right, why does the church avoid talking about homosexuality and other sins, especially in sermons? That's um, um, uh, Evangelist Linnell Perry. I think the reason why is because there needs to be more ministerial training. What we tell people is you got a call from God and you got the anointing, just go out there and do, but there's no training. And I think, in, you know, uh, uh, people feel well, you don't have to have education to, to be anointed, which is true, but you have to have some kind of training. And when you have training, you know how to present the truth in a palatable way where people can understand and receive it. Now, when we were coming up years ago, I mean, they would just, you, this, this was mild tonight, years, years, years ago. I know some preachers that were just raw from the pulpit, and you just kind of shake your head like, oh, Lord. I, so to deal with truth, you don't necessarily have to be raw. There's an educated way that you can present it. Notice tonight I completely dealt with Scripture. I'm trained theologically, but now when it comes to, um, well, I have some training in counseling, but... Um, science and, and, and medicine and things like that, when you're trained, you know to stay within your parameter of authority and not venture out from that, and then therefore you don't come across offensive or ignorant, like you're just talking about things that you don't know. Um, and so I think really that's what's necessary. Evangelist Perry ministers need to be um, trained, and when they're trained, they will know this is how you deal with these things. Now, the message I'm bringing now is primarily would be considered a pastoral message. And so someone that's trained would know if you're an associate minister in a church, you don't get up and do no um, sex workshop in a pastor's church and get the church all in the upheaval and now they're complaining to the pastor unless the pastor specifically asks you to deal with that. And so even as a pastor, you have to be very um, wise in how you deal with it because you have children that are there. Um, and then you have some people that are so um, spiritually minded, any talk like this would really be offensive to them. I don't want to hear, but, and then you have some people trying their best to live right, and if you just mention the word sex, all of a sudden they're, you know, hot and bothered. Um, so you have people in those particular um, areas. And so a pastor um, and leader and a minister, you have your toolkit, which is the Bible, and you need to know what particular tool to use and when and how to use it. Um, you don't just hand somebody a, a, um, a shotgun or, or a rifle in the military and don't train them on that. I understand that in some parts of the military they will blindfold you and you've got to be able to take your weapon apart and put it back together again um, blindfolded because you have to know everything about that weapon and how to work it. If not, you can kill people instead of um, 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 helping people. That's the first part answer to your question. The second part is the reason why a lot of people cannot deal with these subjects from the pulpit is because they're guilty of it. Um, in it right now. It's different if you were in something the Lord delivered you out of it and you're telling people how they can also get out. But there is so much sexual sin among the ministers. And that's not nothing new. Is Since I've been a child, that's been the case. And all different denominations, you can't just point to one. I know people like to throw their finger at the Church of God in Christ. You know, y'all are flaming, y'all are flaming. All these homosexuals and everything. Everybody in the church is not a homosexual. Everybody's not going around in women's clothes and all that kind of stuff. People take one or two people. Well, they're able to come around you and you don't say anything. You don't know that. You know, there's people that talk and minister um, to a lot of these individuals. And some people are emboldened and brazen to go around dressed like a woman because they're like, I dare you to say something. If you say something, they're going to tell the fact that you were the one that slept with them. You're supposed to be a man, a preacher, a man of God, and you're in the hotel with them. And so they know, hey, they're going to come and just flaunt because you can't say anything about it. The, the ox has been muzzled. And where the ox can't even eat, and the ox can't say nothing. And so it's important that we have wholesale repentance in the body of Christ. Um, it's important that we walk upright, do what's right, and then... When you live right, you can, you can preach on anything in this Bible, you know. You can preach on anything in this Bible, anything in the Word of God, and that should be 
your, your aim and your desire. Lord, I want to live this life. Not just talk about it. I want to live this life. All right, I'll take one more question. Most men don't have a father in the home. Yeah, there needs to be courses in church where you deal with that because, yeah, a lot of men don't know how to relate sexually um, to a lady. And so there should be training in that. A lady is not just a piece of meat. Um, uh, that, that's correct. Really good word to God be the glory for that. Should congregants accept their pastor's engagement for long periods of time? Two, three, and six years long. Ooh, Jesus, no. Um, Lady Hankerson and I, we were only engaged for a number of months. I mean, I knew that that's who God gave me. She knew that God gave me to her. Hope she still feels that way. Yeah, she does. Um, and so it was only for a few months. Now, of course, you know what ends up happening when you have a short engagement. People are watching. They're watching the lady's belly. Is she pregnant? And pff, she was. It's like, who saints are some of the gossiping, dirtiest talking folks you'd ever want to meet just tell the saints to shut up that's a message you know put put that make that a sermon somewhere just talk too much wasn't nothing like that at all we just knew that you know that's my spouse and she knew I was her spouse but now two three and six years long ooh, that's a whole lot of time for that fire to get burning so um I don't think I would trust that yeah the ox is muzzled aim to live right at a certain age long engagements are ridiculous that is correct so listen, my friends, I appreciate you so much. Um, we'll be back uh, next week with another uh, awesome topic given by God. God is the one that gives me these um, topics, number one. Number two, you are the ones that help me with these topics because I literally get inboxes.